But today, I want to pick the story up because we left it on a cliffhanger, and I know many of you weren't here last week, so I want to kind of recap just a little bit of this story from 1 Samuel. We've been talking about what to do with mean people. Have anybody encountered any mean people this week in your life? Like you bumped up against them? Hands? All right, some are pointing at siblings. Got it. Okay, get it. Um, we, we, when we talk about mean people, we have seasons where we bump up against these that they're people, not people that just bug you or people that irritate you or people that get on your nerves. We're talking about people that have destructive behaviors, that they criticize everything that you do. They're manipulative. They're unkind. They're controlling. Anybody? You know what I'm talking about? You, you have had those people in your life. Those are who we're talking about in this series. How do we deal with these people? Well, um, we, we looked last week in 1 Samuel, and we talked, about, we talked about David. And one of the things that we picked up on, and these, if you need notes from last week, I'll get you notes from last week, but I wanted to recap. So everything that's about to go on the screen is not in your handout, and I'll tell you when the handout notes are coming. But we talked about when you encounter mean people, if you do not have a plan on what you're going to do before that encounter, you will end up going the wrong way. Because mean people in our lives gain a measure of control of our lives. Because the moment somebody does something against us, our first instinct is what do I say? What can I do to pay them back? Am I right? Like, classic example. I use it all the time because it's true and it's my strong point of, of uh, downfall. But when somebody cuts you off in traffic, right, every thought in the world comes to your mind. Like you remembered that you watched a couple of episodes of On Patrol and you know how to do a pit maneuver and you can if you need to, right? It's always about what can I do to get him back? Oh, I'm going to pass him. Oh, and then uh, I, was, I was listening to a story of a pastor one time that said that um, he cut somebody off in traffic and the person whipped around them and they flipped them off blowing their horn and then they realized... We go to church together, so be careful with that. But mean people will gain a measure of control over our lives because then it kind of puts us in this position where now we're off balance because we will start doing things and overreacting in ways that's not us. We will say things that aren't typically us. We will, our actions will be things that typically aren't us because we're off balance. And so if you don't have a plan, you'll get in trouble real quick. It's just like, the, mo- the most important play in football is the first play of the game, especially if you're a lineman, right? Because an lineman, you want to come off the line hitting the hardest to start with to make a point because you've you got to be on balance w- when you do this. So mean people will keep us off balance. And when we're off balance, we begin to comp- overcompensate in our ability. And this is where we begin saying the things, doing the things that, that aren't us. We'll act differently and because we're not, We're off balance. And then what happens is the person that really is the target of what's causing our issues, what happens to the people that are around us? They end up catching collateral damage because we end up being mean to them. And so our Jesus gives us the golden rule, right? Love your neighbors, you love yourself. And some of us love ourselves probably too much. But we don't like to put in the golden rule we like to put in the iron rule, which means that I'll do unto others as they've done unto me, right? That's operating from a place that we're overcompensating and off balance. Oh, you wrote that about me on Facebook? I'm going to one-up it, and I'm going to post this photo and a comment, and I'm going to make it very vague so people ask questions so I can give some more information. Or I'm going to create a fake social media account and I'm just going to go after you. Or I'm going to make a point, and I'm just going to completely unfriend you. Isn't that childish? I'm going to completely unfriend you from Facebook, right? I'm going to do unto you as you've done unto others. And what happens eventually in all of our payback, we begin trying to outdo, and it gets worse until innocent people end up in the middle of our dramas and our issues, and it completely breaks down unity and especially among believers because listen we're not just saying that christians are perfect some of the meanest people that i've ever run across are in the church anybody else i grew up in in a small town in 
a, uh, in a church that was in the backside of the country, and there were some mean people in that church, right? I remember the first time that African Americans attended our church. I was excited. And then somebody stood up and said, uh, no, not in our church. Those people can't come to our church. And I was like, well, <clears throat> it's good because you're probably not going to be in heaven after making that, and they are. You know, and it, so I, I've had, I've dealt with mean people on that side in the church. And it, it's, it's not good. By the way, everybody is welcome here. Doesn't matter your race, doesn't matter your background, it doesn't matter because the kingdom of heaven is going to look a lot different than what we think it is. So, and if you don't like it and you don't like, you know, you want to live in, in white culture, then I would just say cut the eye holes in your sheet a little bit wider and see that there's a beautiful rainbow uh, of God's beauty. You got me? Some of you will catch that later on the re repeat of this. Um, but we don't, we don't do unto others as they've done to us. We are, we are peacemakers, not peacekeepers. We bring Jesus into every situation. He is our peace. He is our joy. So I can't, I can't go and get people back the way I want to get them back. I can't go with what my first instinct is, is to come and do that. So what, it, what is my option? Now, there's another option that lessens the, the power that mean people will have over us. It's a, it's a place that positions us in such a way where our frustrations kind of diminish and, and we're not so frustrated and we can just move on with life and it never affects our other relationships. The, the other option in this is that it, in, it ensures us that we don't become like the person that we don't like. Because oftentimes when we try to retaliate or when we do retaliate, we become exactly like the people that we don't like. And we don't want to become like people that we don't like. So this other way, Jesus teaches it. Jesus modeled it. We're going to look at it in a minute. But if you remember in this story, there was a woman named Abigail. And we didn't we didn't talk about Abigail last week outside of mentioning her name one time. Remember the Bible, it, it told us about Abigail. It gave us two indications of who she was. It says that she was beautiful. Anybody remember the other one? She was intelligent, beautiful and intelligent. And then we didn't read anything else about her because she's about to play a really big role in guiding David's life to not make what would have been a massive, massive bad decision of retaliation. So David's backstory, if you remember, David killed a guy named Goliath. When he did this, he became a national hero. Now, he's already been anointed to be the next king of Israel. Only problem is he can't be the next king of Israel because there's a king of Israel. So David is in waiting. His brothers are out fighting. He leaves Bethlehem. He grabs some food and he's going to take them some sandwiches. And he gets them all out there. And all of Israel is afraid of these Philistines because you got the big Philistine named Goliath making threats. And if you've been to the valley where this happens, you can get a sense for it. Like when we go to Israel, we, we take people to this valley. It's, it's really interesting because the way the mountains are up and and they were just yelling down, and you could hear voices echoing through the valley. There was fear out the valley. There's also a 7-Eleven now that's right on the side. So you can go witness where David and Goliath had a battle, and then walk over and grab yourself a Coke and some chips, and, and then come back out. Um, pretty sure that wasn't there during that time period. So, so David, with a slingshot, takes Goliath out. Does what no, none of the other warriors of Israel could do, he does as a team. And becomes a national hero of Israel. Everybody's chanting his name. Everybody's talking about David. And that's all they do, is talk about David. And now if you're the king of Israel, and you keep hearing over and over and over again about this young teenage shepherd boy who has no experience in being a king, that would get on your nerves, right? So what does King Saul do? King Saul says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take David, and I'm going to bring him kind of into the family. Not that I love David so much, and I want to provide for David, and I want him to kind of, you know, get a taste of what this kingship's about. But I'm going to bring him in because I don't know that I can trust that he's not going to try to overthrow me before my time's done here as king. And so he sees David as a clear threat to the dynasty of the kingship of Israel. 
So David moves in and it goes south very quickly because now King Saul is trying to kill David. He doesn't like David anymore. He, he realizes that he is a threat. And so David, to protect himself, has now become a fugitive and he's found himself with other fugitives that have left Israel, at least the Jerusalem area. And he's, he's surrounded himself around 600 men who are outlaws with him. All these guys had one thing in common. Saul wanted to kill every one of them. All 600. Now, you may have some people that don't like you. But I don't know if your list includes 600 people who do not like you and want to kill you. And this is who David has aligned himself with as a fugitive. So you can imagine all these conversations. He's young. His mind's being molded with these thoughts. But they pick David as being the leader because David is now a national hero, even among the fugitives, because this guy took Goliath out. So that's the background. This is where the story pops back in. So let's look at these verses again. It says, a, a man in Moan had a business in Carmel, and he was very rich. He had 3,000 sheep, 1,000 goats. He was shearing his sheep in, in Carmel. The man's name was Nabal, his wife's name, Abigail. So Abigail is married to Nabal. Keep that in your mind because that's going to change here in just a few minutes. The woman was intelligent. She was beautiful. But the man, a Calebite, he was harsh and he was evil in the way that he dealt with people. So not, Nabal's not a, a kind guy. So David, remember David's out in the wilderness while Nabal and his wife Abigail are in Carmel. They're very rich. They're shearing the sheep. This was, they would shear them and they would sell all the wool. And this was going to be their profit of how much money they were going to make for the year. So he was very, very rich. So David's hearing about it and knowing that if he's, if he's taking the wool off the sheep, then this dude's got some money. We're going to go ask for money and resources because we're 600 of us out here. We're just living out here in the desert and we need some food. And so David tells them, I want you to go and ask him. He sends 10 men and says, go ask for the prophet money. See if he'll give us some money. Remind him of some things. So in verse 7 says, when, when your shepherds were with us, this is what they're telling Nabal, the 10 men, when your shepherds were with us, we didn't mistreat your shepherds. We, we could have taken them out. We could have killed them. We didn't. And the whole time they were at Carmel, nothing of theirs was missing. We, we didn't kill your people and we didn't steal from your people. Nabal's prophet was due in part to David's protection. So this seemed reasonable because in David's mind, it was like, we could have wiped you out if we wanted to. We chose not to. And because of that, we feel like you owe us. Have you been around those people? They didn't do anything, but then they feel like you owe them. Uh, that is the root of anger, by the way. When you're mad and you're angry at something, it's because you did not get what you wanted. And now you feel like you are owed. And the problem with that is, a lot of the times that anger that you have towards people, they cannot pay back what you feel was taken from you. And you hold yourself a prisoner. And so he says, what was Nabal's response? I sent these 10 men. What was the response back? He says, Nabal said, who's this David? I don't know who this guy is. Who is the son of Jesse? David's men turned around and they went back. And when they arrived, they reported every word. And David said to his men, may each of you strap on your sword so they strapped on their swords. They put their swords on. So they did. And David strapped his sword on as well. Remember last week I told you where David got his sword. When he killed Goliath, he was showing Goliath how to get ahead in life. So he took his sword and chopped his head off. And David has kept the sword as a reminder of the power that God had given him and had used him to take out the threat of Israel. And it was like a promise. And he's carrying a sword that is much bigger than he is. So it's there. He feels the weight knowing that this is the reminder from God. So he puts his sword on and they're going to battle. There's 400 men, the Bible tells us, that decide to go pay Nabal a visit. They're, they're they're going to remind him again that, hey, we could have wiped everything out. We didn't. Now we are because you're refusing to give us any of your resources. No, no food, no money, no anything. We're just going to take it all. Now, is this the way to start your example as a king? What is this going to do? This is going to mess his resume 
all of I mean, because you took out Goliath. That looks really good on the resume. But it's going to be tarnished by got a really, really bad attitude, a really bad temper, and went and stole some stuff and killed some people because he felt like he was owed something that he wasn't owed. And so David is going to pay back evil. He's going to, he's going to pay back evil for evil. Because he says, may God deal with David so severely in the morning. He said, I'm praying that not a single male exists when we get done. That's an attitude. David is hurt. David is angry, just like we are when we encounter people that have hurt and angered us. And he says that he plans to reward evil for evil. He's going to get back at Nabal. Nabal didn't even do anything besides say, I don't know who you are. But he is channeling every frustration that he had about King Saul is going into Nabal. I can't get to Saul, so I'm going to get to him. And he rounds up these other 400 and, and he feels that he is untouchable. And then he's going to stroll up in the city and he's going to take all of Nabal's stuff. Look in verse 14. In verse 14, he says this. One of the servants told Abigail, Nabal's wife, David sent messengers from the wilderness to give our master his greetings. But he instead, he gave insults at them. Yet these men were very good to us. They did not mistreat us. And the whole time we were out in the fields near them, nothing was missing night and day were a wall around us the whole time we were herding our sheep near them. Now think it over and see what you can do. Because disaster is hanging over our master and his whole house, household. He is such a wicked man that no one can talk to him. So Abigail acted quickly. Because Nabal said, okay, he wants to play that game. I can play that game. And we instead will wipe him out. You all see the tension this this building here. You got two groups that before these verses didn't really know each other. But they both feel like now they're owed something. And their anger is getting the best of them. And they have off-balance behaviors, right? And they're, and they're coming after each other. But that last verse is Abigail acted what? Quickly. Because she was beautiful and what? Intelligent. She knew this ain't going this ain't going to go well i've got to do something so she assembles this caravan of donkeys and she puts food on it enough to feed uh, the 400 and she packs it tight and she loads up the donkeys and they begin moving towards these 400 men and we pick up in verse 19 she said to her servants why don't you go ahead i'm going to follow you but she did not tell her husband nabal now why do you think she didn't tell her husband because this dude was in a bad mood, right? Because it says that he's become disastrous and he's wicked and nobody can talk to him. So she didn't have a conversation with him. So she instead goes and gets the resources of his anyway, cleans out the, the account, and she's now bringing that to David. So David is riding along and he's coming down from the mountains and he's griping and complaining I can't believe we're having to do this, but we're going, we're going to go take him out. And, and, and all of a sudden, he sees this caravan of donkeys led by this beautiful, intelligent woman. And his mood kind of changed. It was like, oh, who is this beautiful woman with all this food? So, you know, those moments to where you're really, really mad and then something else gets your attention and it, it's the thing that soothes you and calms you down. He's having one of those moments he says, I can't, I can't stay mad when I got this beautiful woman and this food coming my way. And in verse 23, when Abigail saw David, she quickly got off of her donkey. Y'all should read that in the King James Version, by the way. So when Abigail saw David, she quickly got off of her donkey and bowed down before David with her face to the ground. She speaks to David as if he's already the man that she hopes that he is going to be. Right? And she says, um, let me find my place. She fell at his feet and said, pardon your servant, my Lord. Let me speak to you. Hear what your servant has to say. Please pay attention, my Lord, to that wicked man. Pay no attention to that wicked man, Nabal. He's just like his name. Remember what his name meant? It's in the next verse. It meant fool. And folly goes with him. And as for me, your servant, I did not see, I did not see the men that my Lord sent. She said, I didn't, they didn't come talk to me. 
the guy, the 10 men that you sent, I, I didn't have anything to do with that conversation. I wish that I did, but they talked in the ball. And so she goes, and now, my Lord, as surely as the Lord your God lives, and as you live, since the Lord has kept you from bloodshed, has David fought yet? Where, where's David going to? Where is he off to? He's going to fight, right? He's, there's going to be bloodshed. But listen to her give a little bit of prophecy here. And now, my Lord, as surely as, your, as the Lord your God lives and as you live, since the Lord has kept you from bloodshed, she's given him a warning. And he's kept you from avenging yourself with your own hands. She's saying, David, I know about you. You're not the kind of guy that goes to avenge yourself. You're not the guy that goes and, and has bloodshed. You're, that's not who you are. She, she gives credit to David for being better than what he was about to be. And he says in 27, And let this gift which your servant has brought to my Lord be given to the men who follow you. Now this completely ruined the plans of David because remember David is going to Nabal to get food and get the resources that he thought he owned. Now Abigail comes and brings those things out of the goodness and kindness of her heart and it kind of made the issue go away. That David doesn't want to slaughter anybody. He doesn't want to go and rummage through their things and, and rob from them. And verse 28 says, The Lord your God will certainly make a lasting dynasty for my Lord. Because you fight the Lord's battles. In other words, this ain't the Lord's battle, David. This is you. This is out of your anger. And no wrongdoing will be found in you as long as you live, even though someone is pursuing you to take your life. The life of my Lord will be bound securely in the bundle of the living by the Lord your God. She's saying that even though somebody's trying to steal your life, your life is tucked away in the hands of God. Think about it this way. It's like your life being tucked away at the bottom of a woman's pocketbook. Guys, you ever try to go in your woman's pocketbook trying to find something because you need a key? It's like Narnia in that bag, right? And you look for it and you can't find it and you have a little bit of shame because you don't want to go to your spouse and say, it's not in there. Because how many guys, have, how many times, as she said, it's in the refrigerator and we open the doors and we stare for 45 seconds and we don't see it, so we shut it and then open it again and hoping it's going to be there. And then we have to go have the conversation and be like, honey, it's, it's not in the refrigerator. And she opens it, grabs it, shuts the door and be like, it's right here the whole time. Anybody? Okay, just making sure it's not just me. <laughs> I have refrigerator blindness, apparently. But in the bottom of that purse, if I was like, hey, the key's not there. And she reaches in and pulls the key out. She said, it's been here all along. In God's hands... He knows exactly where you are. Other people may not. He knows where you're at at all times. And he knows where David is. And this promise is being given to David that God knows where you're at. He knows your life. You're safe. You just need to trust him for the things that are needed and stop trying to take it upon yourself to go make a disaster of your life. Just trust me. You might be surrounded by what wasn't an enemy, but now the thing that wasn't an enemy is your enemy, and you're running from Saul. And sometimes, by the way, when we run from the things that God's called us to stay with, we will run towards the mess that we're not supposed to be in. Every time. So Abigail brings David back to his 15-year-old self. Somebody say, we need an Abigail in our life. Because you need some Abigails. You need an Abigail who will tell you, this ain't, this ain't going to look good on you. This is not going to go the way that you think it's going to go. So she brings, she brings David back to 15-year-old David when he's facing Goliath. And she says this, But the lives of your enemies he will hurl away as from the pocket of a sling. In other words, David, did you forget? Did you forget when you were in that valley that day and that giant of Goliath was sitting there hurling insults, making threats. Do you remember? Now? Now what? Now, I want to take you back to that place. Don't you forget God's past faithfulness. Don't forget how He defended you. Don't forget that you don't need to get even. You did not need to get even. You just needed to trust God. And He says in verse 30, when the Lord has fulfilled 
For my Lord, every good thing that he's promised concerning him and has appointed him ruler over Israel, my Lord will not have on his conscience the staggering burden of needless bloodshed of having avenged himself. When this is all said and done, you will not have to deal with that thought in your mind that you messed up and you should listen to God. She's telling him, David, what, what story do you want people to tell about you when, there's not, when, when this, this is all done? What, how do you want people to remember you? That he was the pointed king that killed Goliath, but then he did something really, really dumb and just slaughtered innocent people for no reason. He says in 32, David said to Abigail, please be to the Lord, the God of Israel, who has sent you today to meet me. May you be blessed for your good judgment and for keeping me from bloodshed this day and from avenging myself with my own hands. I have heard your words and I have granted your requests. See, Abigail was wise enough to speak the truth because sometimes we're scared to tell the truth to people because they're going to get mad at us. But I would rather somebody get bad by hearing grace and truth being spoken to them than them going out making a complete disaster of their life. Because ultimately in these moments, we need people who are smart enough, wise enough to speak to us who are trying to get us to where we need to be in our relationships with Jesus. Because what happens is when we're in these moments, we try to do what feels right instead of doing what the scriptures tell us to. And what feels right now will eventually haunt you later on. We do not operate out of emotions. We operate out of Jesus. He gives us emotions as indicators of what is happening in our lives. If we, if we banked on our emotions, a lot of times we'd make really bad decisions. I'll go back to this example. When that Sarah McLaughlin commercial comes on and the arms of an angel starts to play and you see all those animals that need adoption. If we played on those emotions, Sarah McLaughlin would have us with a hundred cats. I would have adopted a hundred cats. You know how I feel about that. Because an emotion like, oh man, these poor animals, even cats, poor things. If we operate on what feels right, that that will come back and haunt us later. Because for David, what felt right was taking care of business. But Abigail knew better. Like, this is not going to make you feel better. In the moment, for that little bit of time, you're going to feel like you were the man. But then you're going you're gonna to feel like trash when it's all said and done, and you're no longer the hero, and you're going to ruin your kingship. So verse 36, when Abigail went in the ball, he was in the house. He's holding a banquet like that of a king because he's spending all his money. He hasn't noticed yet, by the way, that he's missing enough supplies for 400 men. He was in high spirits. He was very drunk. So he told, uh, she told him nothing. No, no reason to have this conversation because he ain't going to understand it anyway. And then in the morning when Nabal was sober, he, his wife told him all these things and his heart failed him. And he became like a stone. And 10 days later, the Lord struck Nabal and he died. Pretty, pretty harsh, isn't it? And then David sent word to Abigail. Listen to this player. He sends word to Abigail. Says, hey, you're beautiful, you're intelligent, I'm single, you're single. So they get married. David gets the food for his men and the resources, and he got a wife out of it. And Abigail becomes his wife, and Abigail quickly got on a donkey, attended by her five female servants, and they went with David's messengers and became his wife. I bet y'all didn't see that about to happen in the story, did you? couple of things real quick you have a couple of options when it comes to dealing with mean people you can do evil for good you can try to justify in your mind like what was done to you and you can have evil for good or you can you can operate evil for evil because sometimes by the way when we talk about evil for good there are people that try to do good things for us and we don't accept it. We always think there's a hidden agenda. We all, and maybe sometimes there is, but the majority of the times there's not. It's just there, there are good people in the world that just want to help. And then we try to pay them back with evil. You can commit evil for evil, bad act for bad act. That's where we are right now in the state of, of the world. Or we can be above the world and do what the kingdom tells us to and give good for evil. That's the Jesus way. Those are our choices. You get to choose those. And if you're a Jesus follower, we have one option. 
That one option is we repay good for evil. We do it. And there's countless stories along the way of the scripture that this is the way it always goes is good for evil. That's difficult. It's hard because you have faces to these, these issues, these pains, these hurts, these traumas. But there's this thing that Jesus modeled called grace. And how many of you know we need that? Every single one of us. The Bible says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That is called grace. We were enemies of God. We could have been wiped out. God could have taken us all out. I mean, he puts Noah on a boat and he floods the earth, takes everything out, gives him a second start. I'm just going to be honest with you. Maybe you shouldn't have done that. Looking at where we are now, maybe we need another ark. Minus all the rain. Jesus says, I want you to follow me. I want you to follow in the ways that I've set. It's, it's a better way. He says in Luke chapter 6, verse 27, he says, love your enemies. <laughs> Hold up, Jesus. I need you to review my list. I need you to, to know the backstories. He didn't mean that you need to be tolerant to those people. He didn't mean that you ignore those people. What he meant was this. You love those people. This doesn't mean that you throw a party for them. This doesn't mean that they bring, you bring them into your home and give them a big celebration. What it means is sometimes loving them is praying for them. And not praying that they step out in front of a moving vehicle. Sometimes it's praying that God would bring blessing on their life. Sometimes it's praying that they will taste and see that the Lord is good. Sometimes it's just smiling at them. Saying hello. Something encouraging. That is counter to what our first instinct is. Am I right? Because that's not my first instinct. And he says, you love your enemies. Then he says, do good to those who hate you. Again, Jesus, I'm going to need you to take a look at my card. He says, I, I thought I was doing good not to hurt them. I was just airing it out and letting everybody know how I feel. And he says, no, 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 no. Do good to those who hate you. And then this. So you love, you do good. But listen to this. Bless those who curse you. Now, first thought is, uh, no thanks. Bless them out, maybe. But be a blessing. But this is what we've been called to do. Pray for those who mistreat you. Don't do something to them. He says, do something for them. Do something for them. That's how you keep from becoming like them. And according to Jesus, it's how we become like our Father in heaven. He says this in, in Luke chapter 6 and verse 35. He says, because God is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. You know how I know that's true? Because he was kind to me. And it was kindness, the Bible says, that leads us to redemption. So if you got some mean people in your life, what would it look like for you to return good for evil? Not writing a very predictable story, but writing a story that is that points to Jesus was at work in the situation. What if you didn't operate off your first instinct when dealing with mean people? What if it was operating off what the scripture says? Some of us need mean people in our lives. It keeps us humble. Do you ever, ever think about that? That sometimes the mean people in your life are actually a blessing? That might be a whole nother sermon, but it's there. The meaner people are, the brighter your opportunity is to shine. And you do for others precisely what they don't deserve to do. All while remembering what it was that Jesus did for us. May not change things in them. But it will certainly change what's within you. And in doing so, you'll be just like your father in heaven. Let me tell you, as we close right now, I'm going to give you one of the best pieces of advice I can. You want to have a healed heart with people that have damaged and broken relationships. The best thing that you can do 
is pray for those people. Because we often get hurt and we pray, we spend more time praying for ourselves and for ourselves to be healed. And that's important. But are we praying for the people? Because when our prayers for those who have hurt us, those enemies, remember Jesus on the cross, the prayer that he prayed was, Father, forgive them. After the way that he had just been treated for the last 24 hours of his life. The first words from the cross in an open air environment of people listening was, Father, forgive these people. So right now, as we, we get ready to sing, here's what I want you to do. I know you're affected by these relationships. And by the way, this is going to be an ebb and flow of you trying to, to maneuver these and work because there are going to be moments where you feel like you're healed and then boom, something's going to trigger it again. And you're going to go right back to your knees and have Jesus straighten that, that path back out for you. Because when we pray, we're doing something. When we pray, we are taking the things that we have zero control over and we're putting them in the hands of God. That's what prayer is. Let me get on the soapbox for one second. Worship team, you guys come on up. We'll transition pretty quick. Sometimes I have found that as believers, we are scared to pray. And what I have learned is when we're scared to pray, it means that we have not relinquished control of our life yet. When we're scared to pray out loud, when we're scared to pray over one another, when we're scared to pray by ourselves, it means that we have not fully come to a surrender of our lives to give God every part of us. Because when we've fully surrendered our lives, we are not scared to hand Him those parts and let Him do as He will do. And it's surrender because I'm taking things that I have no control over. Because let's be honest, we don't have control over anything. It's in His sovereign hands. It's through Him, as Paul says in Acts 17, that we live and breathe and move. So here's what I, my challenge as we get ready to stand. Matter of fact, won't you go ahead and stand with us? We're going to sing, but right where you are, I want you to start praying for those people that you would classify as mean in your life. And I want you to do something different. I want you to pray for blessing over their life. I want you to pray, and part of the blessing is that they hear from the voice of God. Isn't that a blessing? to be able to hear the Father's voice. And I want you to pray that they hear from God and pray that they hear from the Holy Spirit and pray for God to expose things in your heart that needs to be cleansed. That's kingdom living. Let me pray for you. Father, in this room, there are true hurts. We don't want to minimize those hurts. We don't want to put those hurts to the side. But what we do want to do, God, is take people. We can't control people, but we want to put them in your hands and we want to pray blessings. I pray for a healing, an outpouring of healing in this place this it only comes to your Holy Spirit. So may your spirit begin to move in this place as he already has. May he begin to convict hearts. May he soften hearts that are of stone. May we be broken. Broken for the things that you're broken for. And Jesus, we thank you for the healing that's going to take place even in these next few moments and outside of this place. We thank you for that. And I pray for a mighty move of the Father in this place right now. That prayers will be lifted up. Even people would take the courage to pray out loud exactly where they are. And I pray these name, things in the name of the God who sits on His throne and is above every other thing and has the name that is above all other names. Pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen.